Hey, this is Patrick Mahomes, quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in! Oh, oh, oh yeah, baby! That guy, that guy, you pumped? That got me pumped. I feel like he was really overreacting to the beginning of the show. You got me. I thought it was terrible. You caught me. Thursday, April first, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. You caught me, Andy, Jason. <laughs> And Todd. Oh, April Fool's. Got him. Oh. <laughs> uh, we won't linger on the April. That's, is that an April Fool's joke that you're really into, the, the old name switch? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will say this. I, we, we won't linger on it. I, I tweeted about April Fool's because it's, it's stupid. It's the stupidest holiday. Incorrect. Go on. It is. It's so bad. Oh, you guys are diametrically opposed? We are. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but Jason loves Bows. pranks. Jason loves, like, when people feed him dog food and he didn't know. Yeah, I thought it was uh, uh, what, and Cocoa like, Puffs? And he runs out the room angry and then later he's like, wow, that was really awesome. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, that's such a strange about face of reaction. But anyways, uh, we were talking about it in the office. This this hilarious uh, hijinks from Volkswagen that it, it leaked out a couple days ago that they were going to go by Volkswagen because they're switching to all electric. Yeah. What then, a name. Oh, man. Turns out that was a hilarious April Fool's joke that they shot out on March 30th. What is happening? Which is real. I mean, that is – Mike, you're not going to be able to no. handle that. No. I won't, Because now, where does it stop? Oh, where, 15 days in either direction. Where, where do, 15 <laughs> days? Like, where does it stop? Like, where can I uh, pull a hilarious gag and, and then say it was April Fool's? I'm going to tell you the truth. It should be 365. You should be able to do it whenever you want. Yeah, that's going to be funny when we start pulling the spider pranks on you. Yeah. Well, well there are limitations. <laughs> I don't think there are. <laughs> oh, live <my> Cobra. <laughs> Did you say live Cobra? Yeah. Hilarious. Okay. <laughs> you look you look got bit. How <laughs> scared you were of that Cobra. It's not poisonous at all. April Fool's. <laughs> Seriously, you should go to a yeah, hospital. Yeah, uh, We have the overreaction also, episode. Also, you're a big baby. It's a perfect timing because Jason would say Mike is uh, overreacting to April Fool's. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And this is one of my favorite episodes. This is uh, We've each chosen a couple of things from the past year in fantasy football that we are warning you desperately not to overreact to. National pastimes for fantasy players overreacting is oh, one of them because it's the best oh it, it absolutely is and sometimes it's because we we like something that mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. it may not be repeatable but hey we'll we'll take that to the next step it's going to get even better for that player i like we'll oh. overreact to that degree or sometimes it's it's bad and we think something that's going to go wrong is just going to completely destroy a situation um you know l last year uh, on this episode, we uh, I know one of mine was uh, Mike Evans. Not overreacting to losing Jameis Winston and that everything's going to be the end of the world. He's a good player. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the overreactions... The thing is, is it's fun for sports fans to overreact. Yeah. Like, it's fun for me personally to overreact to just things. And so we've got to... We still want to win at fantasy football. We want to be the champion. And so... Uh, don't overreact about these six things. By the way, Mike, my... Uh, you know, my drop the guitar drop i put on the last episode yes april fool's joke i i figured 15 <laughs> days <laughs> hey what a goof what <laughs> what a pistol um ultimate draftkit.com head over there check out the ultimate draft kit for 2021 we also have the udk plus which has the dynasty pass uh you can get access to that content right now speaking of the dynasty pass we have just begun our second rookie mock draft Ooh. so as soon as that is done that will be up there real yeah, quick. Yeah, I ended up with the last pick. You did. And it's not a snake because it's a rookie draft. It's not a snake. So it's really – it's not a snake, man. Um, oh. But the UDK Plus, for those of you that don't know or you've been with us for a long time, you've had the UDK, 
The UDK Plus also has a new draft analyzer tool. So you're going to be able to input your team or import your team and get a player-for-player team-based analysis and grade for your roster. And it, this is going to be invaluable because people ask us every year, the demand is high for validation mm -hmm. um, or validate your greatness. correction or you know guidance. Like, do you have a weakness on this team? And we're going to be able to tell you some of the weaknesses on your team, the strengths, grade your team, and that's all going to be part of the UDK Plus as well at ultimatedraftkit.com. I'm going to give everyone Fs. Yeah, I mean, oh, that makes sense. Oh, you fell for it. Oh, is that an April, April Fools? April Fools, guys. We shouldn't have started this. Mm. Ready for some buy-sell? <laughs> Let's do it. Buy or Sell, presented by Pristine Auction. What what repressed memory does Mike? Oh, it's it's not a repressed memory. Is Mike memory. acting out against with April Fools? What happened to you? Something when you were eight years old, Mike? Nope, no, it's not a repressed memory at all. Were you promised a sibling by your parents, and then it was a, like a fake pregnancy? They were like, "Nope, you're gonna be a, nope. you're gonna be a big brother, Mike." Nope, it is simply the fact that. Uh, when, when someone expects we're me not to, getting divorced is when someone ex <laughs> expects me to tell them the truth and i and they're like and they believe it and i'm like oh i got you i was lying like wh I'm, I'm more on your side yeah. than i am jason's but you know yeah. different strokes for different folks all right i'll kick us off here yes um well, for we, do real. you know what we're talking about <laughs> yeah we're buying we're and in selling, buy sell. Jason. oh did you think we're in a different segment i was just ready to overreact <laughs> kick yeah. us off man all right kick uh, kick us off here with deandre swift are we buying or selling uh, that he's going to be a top 15 back in 2021 ooh, he only played okay. in 13 games in 2020 and he was the rb 18 that was in his rookie year they've talked about building him around him a little bit but they also signed jamal williams you know, if he takes a step forward and plays 16, is he going to land in the top 15? He's obviously... You mean play 17? 17. Oh, that's right. Oh, man, it's all changing. Um, But, uh, you know, he's he's obviously a talented back. I think all three of us would say... Yes, firmly uh, agree. He's, he, he's a very good player. Right. His situation isn't perfect, so fantasy managers are going to have to decide on draft day, like, Will he overcome his situation based on talent or not? And I think the, the top 15 is the right barometer. Yeah, I was going to say the top 15 is within his range of outcomes, no question. Mm -hmm. Do I think he'll get there? No, I don't. I will sell Ooh, okay. DeAndre Swift top 15 running back. I don't make a habit of betting on r the running game in Detroit and a single talent coming out of that backfield and contributing for fantasy football. It hasn't happened very often. I don't think it makes it a higher probability of happening when you swap uh, Matthew Stafford, who was able to at times put the team on his back, and you swap him out for Jared Goff. I know this team wants to run the football, but Jamal Williams, that's a significant passing down addition to the team that I think will I prohibit DeAndre Swift from being a top 15 fantasy running back, so I will sell. It's tough because it comes down to the passing work. I, Matt Stafford historically throws to his running back a lot. This was this wasn't just scheme. This wasn't just DeAndre Swift. He throws it to the running back. Like like Philip Rivers, you know that Matthew Stafford is going to give his running back a bunch of targets. Jared Goff has. I mean, you we have a couple years here where Todd Gurley from Jared Goff, 87 targets, 81 targets. So it's it's not a it, we have some proof of concept of concept that Jared Goff has been a check down machine, uh, and that's what it comes down to. We've seen since in since 1990, only two rookie running backs have had 45 or more receptions in fewer than 14 games. Like it's he was out of control with his five receptions every single week. Receptions are a quick path to the top 15, and uh, so I top 15. This is more of an Eckler type of angle, maybe. With the, with the passing game work pro propelling them. Because sure. Eckler was able to do that, right? Be a top 10 right. guy with, what, 100 carries? But DeAndre Swift is going to get a, a lot of carries. I agree with you that Jamal Williams is an actual problem for fantasy, that Jamal Williams is, a, is an excellent player as well and can and take some of that work. Top 15, I will buy. Because okay. you're thinking, like, one, essentially one running back per per team, you know, 
can be a running back one or is there a running back one? Like, like how many, how often do you see two running backs from a team be in the top 15? So with half of the league, I th- I'm just, I would call Swift in my top 15. Yeah, I, I uh, process of elimination. He, he certainly is talent wise, but I'm going to sell this. I, I don't believe for fantasy purposes that he finishes inside the top 15. They don't have an offensive line that I think is impressive. I don't think they're going to be in in the the game scripts to run the ball as much as they would prefer. I don't think the touchdown opportunities are going to be there. Um, so in the end, I think he's probably a a, a solid running back two. Um, I will sell the top 15 line. Mike, do you like DeAndre Swift, based on your buy, more or less than Clyde Edwards-Alaire in 2021? I would take Clyde. So you think Clyde is a top 15 back I do. as well? Okay. Yes. That was Buy or Sell, brought to you by our friends at Pristine Auction. Use the code BALLERS at pristineauction.com. BALLERS. These fine gentlemen, thank you very much. I just mm, had a birthday. Yes, you did. And a box, a little box came in the mail. It's a medium. It's kind of a medium-sized box. Yeah. box. Why you got to? I knew it was a helmet. The size of the box. I, I knew it was a helmet, and it was a Justin Jefferson Matt Vikings signed helmet. Thank Where you. do you think we got it? Uh, it wasn't. You didn't go get it from Justin himself. No, that's too much work. <laughs> pristine right. auction, baby. We He's also have a, a Jefferson jersey on the wall today. So check it out, pristineauction.com. Yeah, yeah. um, sorry, Jason. One more segment before oh. you can get things started for us. <laughs> Some news. News and notes from around the league. All right, I'll kick us off here. <laughs> the NFL has officially approved a 17th regular season game for the 2021 season. Is that what it's like to not be hosting the, the show? You just sit here and listen? For you, yeah. And, then, and then I react, though, right? That's like, right. What do that, you think? Whoa, 17 games. Oh. We're going with where are we going to play this? All right. Steelers have signed running back. Oh, what, what happened? I didn't hit it. I was getting into it. I was going to say, though, a an April Fool's shtick that I could have got behind was moving Jason over into the hosting chair. Mm. And oh, then thanks had, for had bringing him, it up. Well, I, I just thought of it now. Yeah, that would have been dangerous. <laughs> yeah. I think we would have been fun. A lot of extra... Uh, listens on that episode. We would have started with some different segments. I know that. <laughs> That's right. Um, Kalen Balaj, one-year contract with the Steelers. Yep. I uh, skipped the big news, though. Kalen Balaj was so involved in Los Angeles last year. Um, we do have some bigger news. Yes. Seahawks are giving Tyler Lockett a four-year, $69 million extension. Whew. Nice. Uh, $37 million guaranteed. That's a lot of money. We're talking Nelson Aguilar levels of quiche this off season. Um, it's a lot more than Nelson Aguilar. Yes, it is. It's but it, it, you know the free agent market there wasn't really one, um, and so this actually does make some sense. You know that when you extend a guy now, while the market is a little repressed. You can give him big money in this market, and it will actually turn out to be good for your team as the salary cap goes up. That's actually, uh, yeah, it's super smart of them because he's so foundational to their um, inconsistent passing game. That, that is <laughs> well said. Yeah, last year finishes the number nine overall fantasy wide receiver. A reminder, 44th inconsistency. So never been a top 20 consistency player, always been an elite receiver in actuality and so valuable for Russell Wilson and the team. You know, His absence would go a long way towards damaging fantasy value for Russell Wilson. And yeah, now he's locked up. And a phenomenal best ball asset as well because he's he's been a top 15 wide receiver the last three seasons. You're going to get all of his big games, and he won't be in your starting lineup for his duds in a best ball format. All right, one more piece of news. I'm going to call it buy, sell with Bruce. All right, it's a it's a new segment. I just started it. Um, Can't wait. Bruce Aaron says a lot of things. He By the way, does. he also got himself tattooed. Yeah, so all that. It's a pretty nice looking. He one. finally came through. Got with, the Tampa Bay tattoo. One, no, with one of the things that he said. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Here, here's three comments from him. Uh, O.J. Howard should be ready to participate in the offseason program, the Achilles injury for Howard. Do you buy that? Yes. Okay. It's, yeah, yes-ish. All right. Mm. Uh, he doesn't know who will be his 2021 starting running back. Do you buy uh, that? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, 
I buy that 1,000%. He doesn't know who his starting running back is going to be every single week, <laughs> week of the to year. Week. All right, so in that case, his last comment, buy, sell with Bruce, uh, did, he expects Keyshawn Vaughn to have a breakout year in 2021. Do you buy that? My heart chooses to believe this, um, but my brain... <laughs> says my heart <laughs> wants to believe it jason no i do not believe that at all i think that is his obligatory what? uh fluff piece trying to build the player up and the, but in the end i don't think uh he's well you know david that. johnson year two with bruce arians yeah but david johnson year one with bruce arians was awesome but i bet keisha von wanted to be awesome that he did. is true <laughs> and that's that's the problem is that I thought Keyshawn Vaughn would be a solid player. So did the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They they drafted him in the third round, and then he could not get on the field. However, to try and spin something for Vaughn, he was he was on the COVID list, right? Uh, if I'm remembering that I correctly, he did. during the training camp, whatever it was, uh, period, he was on the actual COVID list. Uh, so he so yeah, he had some things against him for. His first year, I, it's not impossible for him to contribute to the Tim team, but a, re-signing but a breakout Burnett wasn't necessarily a good sign for him. Sure, a depth chart clogger that Fournette is. I mean, but at this, but at the same time, you got you put your Super Bowl band back together, and they did not pay Leonard Fournette much money at all. I, th I think if I were the Buccaneers, that's an easy move to make, just to bring him back. Yeah. Even even if he doesn't play and Vaughn takes his spot and it's Ronald Jones and Keyshawn Vaughn paying Fournette to be the third string running back uh, when you know he can jump in and contribute to the team, I think that was the wise move. All right, Jason, I know you can't hold on any longer, so we'll get to the segment you're most excited about. I'm not going to do what you all think I'm going to do, which is just flip out. All right, I'm going to kick us off here, if that's oh, all right. Oh, my goodness. People are overreacting to Ezekiel Elliott's down year, and I totally understand. We see these top flight running backs take a step down, and then poof, they're done. Todd Gurley yep. was just on top of the world. He was great, and he takes a step down, and then poof, it's, it's over. He's D-U-N. People are starting to act like this mentally with, Ezekiel Elliott. I was in a, uh, I was on the a, a pod appearance, the Wizarding World of Fantasy Football. We did a four round mock draft. Ezekiel Elliott almost hit the second round of that mock draft, and I've seen him going behind Chubb, behind Eckler, behind JTT. He's usually right now about the running back eight. I think it is a mistake to overreact from what happened last year to think that Ezekiel Elliott is done, that he's washed. Look, while Dak was there last year, he had five games with Dak. Ezekiel Elliott was the running back three. He was phenomenal the first five weeks of the season. The offense was good. He had uh, two top three weekly finishes in that stretch. And he's not an old elder statesman. I know it feels like it because he came into the league very, very young. But he's the he's younger than Aaron Jones. But that's crazy. Right? It doesn't that that's feel crazy weird? Talk. He's the exact same age as Dalvin Cook and Alvin Kamara and Kareem Hunt. They're they're all within like a month or two of each other. I think I think uh, Alvin Kamara and Ezekiel Elliott are three days apart. So they are they're the same age. This is not an old man. Here's what happened. Dak Prescott, your great quarterback, mm -hmm. went down to injury. Your offensive line dealt with injuries, and your offense struggled. Even your backup quarterback, Andy Dalton, missed a couple of games. It got rough. Then Zeke missed a game for the first time ever, and it just felt like, well, this is the beginning of the end. And, and in that game, Tony Pollard had a breakout performance. Yeah, and that, that's why you think, okay, well, Pollard's going to get more involved – um, Zeke is older. There's a lot of wear on the uh, on the tires. I don't believe it. I think that overreacting to what happened in a bad year for the Cowboys is a mistake. I believe that Ezekiel Elliott is firmly a top five back. He will be great for fantasy. He will play this whole season. He is their he is their guy. So I believe Zeke is still a phenomenal uh, running back. And if you're in a if you're in a dynasty league, I think you can. You can make a move to get Zeke for a lot less. Are you letting him go, Brooksy? Don't you have Zeke? I do. 
But you're a Dallas fan. Uh, that doesn't weigh too heavily. Here. So what's interesting <laughs> about the overreaction episode is that we get to, other than the ones we have crafted, we get to react mm -hmm. to your thoughts. And I tried to go in as blind as I could with your guys' uh, you know, points here. And, and the initial reaction to Zeke is kind of fatigue. There's a level of fatigue that happens, even though he's yep, great. It always happens. And part of it is last year. Part of it is, um, I guess, knowing what the ceiling probably is, which is a good ceiling, but it's just knowing what the ceiling is. and probably what, what is that ceiling to you? That ceiling is a very consistent player, no breakaway plays. Um, you know, hopefully you get in the red zone a lot. He's double-digit touchdown guy. But so He's a like volume play. Top, end of the season. Not, Do you feel like top three has – that ceiling has vanished for him? Um, I think it would be tough for Zeke. Yeah, I think top three I probably am out on, but top five is I'm not out on, so it's okay. right there. And and all your points are very well received. I think it's it, it makes a lot of sense. And he's built like the kind of running back that has a long, sustained career. He is not C.J. Spiller who, who loses the wheels someday. or mm -hmm. um, he He's a player that is going to get you chunks, not big-time you know, breakaway runs, but just give him the ball. He gets better as the game goes on and his head gets bigger and bigger or whatever happens. He just beats up the defense and that those kind of players, that's the Emmett Smith, you know, that just continues to give you season after season of productivity. And, and when, when these players just poof at the running back position, there's usually a sign and a re like Todd Gurley. We, he, we knew about the knee issue. Yeah. It, we knew that he was being sat and rested and that he had this degenerative we, knee that was we not knew coming into the his career that he was going to have a knee problem. Right. With Eddie Lacy, when he poofed, it was like he poofed up and then all of a sudden yeah. it's like there you can see it. There was nothing to me on film that said Zeke is not a good back anymore. Yeah. And the team is, you know, it's a winnable division for them. I think they're going to be in in the thick of it. And, you know, nine and a half, I think, was the win total coming out of Vegas for Dallas, and they've got a lot of upside to that. So it makes sense. Um, you mind if I go next, Mike? Is that going to oh, please bother you at all? Well, it, I mean, it's going to turn into a Dallas Cowboys show if I go next. Um, and we don't want that. No, we'll, uh, we'll stay in division, though. Lover. I'm going to talk to you about – I'm going to do the dirty work, uh, the dirty job on this show. Um, I believe that you should not overreact to – the four games of Jalen Hurts that you saw last year, and I want to warn the world about what can happen to Jalen Hurts and what I think will happen. Uh, my kids collect Pokemon cards. Uh, Pokemon, they, and they catch them all. They, they love them, right? And, and when you buy a pack of Pokemon cards, there is infinite potential within that pack. Mm -hmm. You do not know what's in it. You may pull the shiniest, hollow, whatever words they're telling me are the best cards you can get. That pack has infinite potential, and as fantasy players, our pack always has the insert card. Our pack almost always has that elusive, I'm the luckiest man alive situation inside of it. And I am very, very concerned that Jalen Hurts, when you open the package and you see what's inside – is going to disappoint fantasy players. Now, every one of these uh, upside quarterbacks comes down to the dilemma of price, right? What are you going to end up paying? Right now, he's going as the QB9 around a six-round pick. Wow, you're, you're out on QB9. If he's sitting there, then you're, the risk is, is not high. It's not extremely high. Because maybe that reward is there as the rushing quarterback that that Jason wants him to be, and and the potential for Jalen Hurts. However, we have an NFL draft coming up, and if you add a piece to the offense that 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 unopened pack can wrap its mind around, Jalen Hurts hype can get get out of control. And I feel like one of my gifts and curses on this show is smashing the hopes of people who want to hype up quarterbacks on this show. Last offseason, it was Big Ben and Gardner Minshew. And specifically with Minshew, I have some of the same concerns that I have with Jalen Hurts. The team was not – they were committed enough to move down from six. They were committed enough to trade their franchise quarterback. Is that what you're calling Carson Wentz? That's what he was. I don't think you've called him that on the show in a long, <laughs> long time. No, no, no. 
that's who he was to them. Not to me, but to them. Like They were ready to move on from Carson Wentz. That does not mean they're ready to move forward with Jalen Hurts forever. Because the, fina- the financial commitment to Jalen Hurts is not the kind, much like Gardner Minshew, that would mean that you cannot move forward if something goes south. Um, you have had off-season hype around players with running game potential in the past. Daniel Jones got a lot of hype. He runs the ball a lot. He shows you that you can run the ball a lot and not be a great fantasy quarterback. Cam Newton, 12 times into the end zone last season. Good running quarterback, finished at 16 at the position. Marcus Mariota, I remember the hype coming into the year, the amount of rushing efficiency that he had and the touchdowns. There is a negative outcome here for Hertz. That's point one, that there is a possible negative outcome. Okay. If you look at what he did last year, you had Welcome to the NFL, 18 rushing attempts, set the world on fire. His rushing attempts went down every single game. You got game film on on Jalen Hurts. You also had uh, completion percentages that declined, 56%, then 55%, then 54%, then 35% in the final game. He is not a player that I trust the passing prowess of. And the one of the best points I think I have against Jalen Hurts is how – extremely happy were you with Lamar Jackson last year. He's an MVP who runs better than anybody in NFL history. Now, I don't think any of us think Jalen Hurts is a better runner no. than Lamar Jackson. Lamar no. is a clear but, better runner. But to answer your question, thrilled. Well, you were and, because you traded and for and him in the second champion. half of the year. Don't submarine what the point is. You know how... Champ, champ. Champ. <laughs> People that drafted Lamar Jackson last year were yes. disappointed. And tons yes. of middling outside the top 10 performances for Lamar, who's a better runner. There aren't pass catching options that get you enthusiastic in Philadelphia. And let me let me put a bow on it for you. Just for this is just cursory. Don't overreact to Jalen Hurts as the next big thing. Here's his home schedule. Okay? You already know the division he's in. I think Philadelphia is dead last in that division. I firmly do. I've said that all offseason. So I, this is the Gardner Minshew problem. If you're not a great team, you're going to run in, into some issues. Okay. He plays. He's got Washington at home, number one against in passing yards per game. You got San Francisco at home, fourth. Los Angeles, fifth. You've got Dallas. They were sixth. You get to play the Super Bowl champion Buccaneers, and then the Chiefs at home. You get to play the Saints, eighth against passing uh, at home. I mean, an improved Giants defense. Okay, whatever. What about against running quarterbacks, though? I don't. Well, I, Look, if you don't have both of those pieces, you're not getting that that quarterback from Jalen Hurts. He his his the way the teams will get to play Jalen Hurts changed over the end of last season, and they will change next year if he cannot throw the football. So I am just throwing out there the if this keeps creeping up, if this is the QB seven, the QB six, the QB five, everybody wants the the pack to come with the perfect card. I'm just saying it can go sideways. That's all. I yeah, don't. I think it, people are overreacting. I'm not necessarily talking to Jason. I'm just. Saying, I feel like you're talking directly I'm to Jason. That, that, that people have overreacted with Jalen Hurts. Is it my turn yet? <laughs> uh, so to, no, you to had have your another turn. overreaction. You had your overreaction. To react. Uh, to react. All right. Um, this is. I, I. I saw this here. I, I knew before he put it in, he was gonna uh, have a, a Jalen Hurts. Uh, don't overreact. And, and to his credit, he was absolutely right on, on Gardner. If Philadelphia is a terrible team that struggles and is a basement dwelling uh, option in that division, then, then yeah, it's probably not going to go well. I believe Jalen Hurts is, is good. I think he will be uh, a, a top quarterback. So I have a proposition that I don't see how you turn down here, Andy. Oh, a water bet of a top eight quarterback. I think that's, I mean, He's quarterback nine. You're saying this is there's some overreaction happening. Water bit. I don't mind it. Let's do it. Yeah, I definitely definitely He's don't mind for it. The button. Water bet. I don't I don't want the water bet to submarine the message of the show though. Okay, where it's like this is not boom and bust. This is not like I'm picking a bust season. I'm picking dis, uh, disappointment proportional to overreaction. I think people are not seeing what's there in front of them. This was not a smash, uh, you know, draft this quarterback, top of the board type of player. There are a lot of holes in his game, and they came out in the completion percentage over the entirety of the year. If that, And I don't see the pieces around him that are going to make that change, he especially cert- in that division. He certainly does not have, uh, a, well, a receiving core right now. Jalen Rager hasn't proven anything. They let Alshon go. They let DJX go. 
So it's Greg Ward and, and Jalen Rager. That does not inspire confidence. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But it's All exciting, right. right? You got the. It, it's yeah. exciting to not know what's going to happen, and sometimes we take that over what's rest assured. Just the the my only reaction to it is if people are still in in the FFPC are taking him at QB nine. I would say that they are not overreacting to the possibility yeah, yeah. and the promise of Jalen Hurts. So can I kind of speak to that? Sure. When you draft in those leagues, you are drafting for big money and big yeah. potential. And so you, you're you not necessarily approaching it the way that a redraft league might approach consistent play at the quarterback position. You're looking at Jalen Hurts and seeing prolific running numbers and saying, boy, if I catch a Lamar Jackson year with Jalen Hurts, I win the entire F FPC. Yes. So I think that that threshold, like I would have liked to seen maybe what the temperature is like in redraft world because if it's further down from six, there's not a lot to lose there. You just pivot. But, um, you know, I don't know if it speaks to the, the same thing at a redraft league. All right. Uh, I'll go with, go with my first one here. And what's interesting about this the, this topic that I want to bring up is I I have two players – because they're going back to back, I looked up some consensus rankings, and I don't know which player is being overreacted to. All right, and I alluded to it that was going to be a Cowboys show, but Amari Cooper and Ceedee Lamb are being are being consensus ranked right next to each other. I found that really fascinating. Which, I did not know that till I saw this today. Which is wild to me. I and I guess that. The, my over what I think the overreaction is people bailing on Amari Cooper too long or too quick. And if you've listened to this show for any length of time, you know that if I have a chance to take a shot at Amari Cooper, I'm going to take it. This is delightful, Mike. I, <laughs> we're seeing a pro Amari Cooper take yeah, care from me. Maybe, maybe. On, it's April 1st. <laughs> maybe. So. Oh. Maybe, maybe it's an anti cd Lamb, but that also sounds ridiculous because I love CeeDee Lamb, the player. Uh, in the first four games, similar to Zeke, Amari Cooper with Dak Prescott was averaging 13 targets a game. He was averaging nine receptions and 100 yards per game. Now, granted, the Cowboys' opening schedule was weird where they kept blowing leads and they would have to come back, and Dak Prescott was putting up insane numbers. And CeeDee Lamb, to his credit, in those first four games was averaging five for 77. Now, according to Pro Football Focus... And those were his actual first four games. Yeah, those were in that's the what NFL. I mean, his actual first four games. According to Pro Football Focus, CeeDee Lamb took the highest percentage of his snaps in the slot of any wide receiver. 101 of 109 targets, of CeeDee Lamb's targets, were from the slot. Now, CeeDee Lamb is an incredible player. And you can be a productive fantasy player from this if you are a full time slot player. It's not impossible, but it is very difficult if you are a full time slot player to really be a fantasy superstar, which is where it doesn't make sense to me that he's being drafted right next to Amari Cooper. Interesting. The top ten here are the, the top ten slot snaps, uh or wide receivers taking their snaps from the slot. Juju, C D Lamb, Greg Ward, Tyler Boyd, Cole Beasley, Anthony Miller. Keelan Cole, Larry Fitz, Tyler Lockett, and Zach Pascal. There's not oh. superstars. There are not a lot of superstar fantasy wide receivers sitting in that list. And Amari Cooper's not old, just like Zeke. Well, and Michael Gallup, didn't we just have the stat where he yes. took the oh, literally yeah, he, no snaps from the, the slot? Exactly. It, it, Gallup is an outside wide receiver. Amari Cooper will move around, which and you want your you want your wide receivers, honestly, to move around. You want your, you want Julio Jones to sometimes go into the slot. Like it, it's part of the game. Get a mismatch. But if you're there all the time, that means you're getting those. You're getting a, a low average depth of target. It's just it's far more difficult. Amari Cooper will be 27 this year. He is not at an age where he is going to be automatically surpassed by the new hotness on who, the who team. Who doesn't get to play on the outside? Exactly. So. Do you know what the overreaction is here? No, I, I don't. Please I, tell me. I feel like the overreaction is overreacting to Chris Godwin and Calvin Ridley. 
these these players who they, they were the young hotness. They were on a team that already had a star, and both of them overcame and became the number one for their team. Two years ago, it was Godwin over Evans. Last year, it was Ridley over Julio. And so now it's like, I want to get the next Call the one. Shot. I want to have that next one. CeeDee Lamb is right there. I mean, he is, he is, he is unbelievable. He is great. But I think you're right. If, if we're just talking redraft here, Dynasty, I would take CeeDee Lamb ahead of Amari Cooper. That's fair. Um, but – in, in a redraft, looking at this season, the most fantasy points, you've got to go with the primary first read target who plays on the outside, who's always been good in Amari Cooper, who also has $100 million to his name. So, I, like, I, I think Amari Cooper and C.D. Lamb going right next to each other um, is, well, is a little weird. Uh, I think Tyler Lockett might be the, the fair comp for C.D. Lamb's type of season this year. Like, your ceiling for C.D. Lamb could be some explosive, you know, it's not like T.Y. Hilton, Tyreek Hill, they move into the slot, they run deep, they catch a touchdown. Mm -hmm. Lamb's going to do some of that. Yes. But the Tyler Lockett, what I wanted to start him versus somebody more consistent, that's where that decision may be more difficult. And Lockett was one of the names you brought up is frequently playing from the slot. Yeah, so I... I think my official verdict is that people. I are heard just, my guy Amari Cooper. Did that's you hear that? What I, I Mike think the said. official verdict <laughs> of the over. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> is April is, Fools on me? It is this. I am. I am getting myself. I think the reaction overreaction is that Amari Cooper is being drafted too low, or is being ranked too low. Okay. Well, look, Jason made the point. I vomited in my mouth just yeah. now. The new hotness is very attractive, especially when it works out with a consensus like. Godwin and it's it, it's the uh, the girlfriend meme of oh, the guy turning over the shoulder. Yeah. yeah, and and it was a tough year to watch Dallas without Dak. I mean, and on the yep. offensive side of the ball, and and you you look and like the Julio Calvin Ridley thing that would it's not one of the ones we're talking about today, but that's in the honorable mention is the Julio Jones has done Calvin Ridley is all there is. Like Julio has potential to. Drop to the point where the reaction to last year is inappropriate. It could be. All right, Jason. I believe you are. Um, you're up. All right. And I read this one, mm -hmm. and I was shocked, and then persuaded. All right. Well, I am telling everybody the Foot Clan, especially people that have listened to this show and they're up to date on what has happened in Seattle, to not overreact to the whole news about Seattle wanting to run the ball. They do. They want to run the ball. They want to run the ball so desperately that they fired Brian Schottenheimer, who is like Mr. Run the Ball, mm -hmm. because he didn't want to run it as much, right? The whole let Russ cook. We saw the I splits. I hear Bill Callahan turned the job down because they didn't, <laughs> they didn't like, want to run that much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we, we all know the splits last year where uh, Russell Wilson, MVP, shoe in the first half of the year, th throwing the ball left, right, and center. You you know, the first eight weeks at, at, at the break, at the halfway point in the season, you had DK Metcalf as the wide receiver two and Tyler Lockett as the wide receiver four, Russell Wilson on fire. They started to turn the ball over, lose games. Pete Carroll said, no, this isn't how we play football. We're going to change. And so they ran the ball more. They passed less is the is what people think happened. They fired Brian Schottenheimer, and they brought in someone to really get back to defense and running the ball. Here's what happened the second half of the season. This great DK Metcalf, the number two overall, he was only the wide receiver 17 from week nine on. Mm, disappointing. Tyler Lockett, even in his inconsistency, big games, bad games, was the wide receiver 24 the second half of, of the season. So these aren't great options, and I think people might try to overreact and take that second-half stretch and say that that's the truth about DK Metcalf, that that's the truth about Russell Wilson, that that's the truth about Tyler Lockett. This is a team that's not going to throw the ball that much. They're going to have you know their opportunities to get a big play over the, uh, you know, over the top after the defense has, has sucked in, but this is very similar to la how I feel about last year with with Mike Evans being left for dead in a lot of places. Tyler Lockett is good. Say what you want about his consistency, but he's a great wide receiver. Seattle he's, thinks that he is good right? as well. I, I had this in here before uh, the news came out that he was going to get a $69 million extension. Um, it, you know, you look at the, the, the data of when Russell Wilson's targeting Tyler Lockett. He's basically a, a perfect quarterback. DK Metcalf is is far, far better than Tyler Lockett. 
these players are great, and they will produce for fantasy football. In weeks 10 through 17, if you look at the difference of Russell Wilson, he went from throwing 37 pass attempts a game to only 33. That's, this is not that big of a gap. What happened was he was really inefficient. He wasn't very – Russell Wilson just wasn't very good the second half of the year. Which and, is kind of the opposite of his MO in years past, right? He ended yeah, on he fire. Is. Right. And so, I mean, I think we would all bet, unfortunately, on Russell Wilson. Being good, getting the job done, winning ball games. Why is this unfortunate? I'm a Arizona Cardinals fan. Okay. You're I wasn't, I I wasn't mean, this sure is, where it was coming from. But the point is here – um, I, the talent will win out. And I think that if people are afraid of uh, believing in these wide receivers as top options in Russell Wilson as a top quarterback and just looking at the second half of last year and the coaching change and saying they're not going to pass the ball a lot, I think they're going to miss out on really good fantasy options. Yeah, I, it's that whole binary yes-no problem that you can have. I mean, I'm with you. If 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 Russell Wilson's still the quarterback on day one, right? If he is, it's because he's been persuaded that this team is going to not completely muzzle what makes him great, which is throwing the football and being efficient. You can't expect him to not demand a trade out of there if they're going to take the ball out of his hands entirely. There could be a very balanced offense. There could be an overreaction to the narrative. Uh, so I think that's a good point, and it it's still going to make it difficult to know which wide receiver to grab and, and play. But that's been a problem for years, regardless of how mm -hmm. pass-centric they are. All right, I've got my second uh, overreaction. It's one we've talked about collaboratively, but it's a, a reminder. It is to not overreact to the touchdown oh, yeah. outliers. You're speaking my language over here. Be Talk, talking about math and statistics. Yeah, it's just one of those things that is easy to do. Um, a couple of like kind of talking point players might be, you know, a couple wide receivers. Devontae Adams, Adam Thielen. This past year, Devontae Adams, he's a touchdown scorer. Yes. 18. Okay. That is that is abnormally high. His average was 10. That's great. But that is almost double his normal average at the wide receiver position over the last four years. Adam Thielen's average over the previous four years was six touchdowns. Yeah. He had 14. Don't forget Devontae Adams missed two games. <laughs> he had, I, he had I 18 get it. touchdowns in 14 games. And both of those players were, uh, they had seven touchdowns inside the five-yard line. That's the most of any wide receivers over the last five years. Uh, the average for that is like 3.4. So those are a couple examples of players that far surpassed their averages at the touchdown position. But I do have lists of the top 10 players who have the highest percentage of their fantasy points associated to touchdowns. Touchdowns are not predictable. Uh, they fluctuate year to year. We've seen it. Alvin Kamara year to year. Mm -hmm. um, even, even Devontae even, Adams. Even great players. Lev, Lev Bell in his prime was like some years he'd have a ton of touchdowns. Some years he wouldn't. It, touchdowns are not guaranteed. So just to bring to light, and, and I'm going to bring the names up, and, and some are a little bit concerning, and some of them aren't. But Adam Thielen is the number one. 38% of his fantasy points came from touchdowns. So that is that one jumps out as like, hey, be, yeah. be a little bit careful there. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Evans, 36%, not that surprising. Yeah, it makes sense. Double-digit kind of guy, and he wasn't at an outlandish total that was outside of a career arc. Devontae Adams, 35%. Again, you expect him to score touchdowns. Uh, A.J. Brown, though, 32%. You know, it's not a high-volume player in A.J. Brown, so if he doesn't score... You could see some variability with A.J. Brown. Tyreek Hill, 31%. You still can see variability with him. Uh, Hollywood, 31% of his fantasy points to touchdowns. That He will need it. Yeah, and, and that was all like the last four or five games. Of you kind of touchdown of every week. Yeah. And then on the running back side, just to bring some to light, uh, Alvin Kamara is the number two highest percentage of fantasy points associated to touchdowns, 37%. Um. Nick Chubb, 36%. DeAndre Swift, 36%. That one's kind of interesting. Antonio Gibson, 35.8%. Antonio now, Gibson scored a lot of touchdowns. The, the, funny thing about, probably shouldn't have. the funny thing about Gibson, though, because I wanted to bring him up as an example of a concern, and we brought that number up a lot this offseason. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, my gosh, 11 touchdowns. Yeah. He had like 100 and something carries. I mean, that was the one 
counterbalance there was like, okay, you're crazy efficient, but you had a low amount of carries. Maybe you get some balance. That's how out. I feel about AJ Brown as well. I, I think his touchdown rate will come down. Gibson's touchdown rate will definitely come down. But their utilization rate might go up. It's just yeah. it'd be irrelevant in the end. J.K. Dobbins, thirty three percent of his fantasy points are connected to touchdowns. That is you know, that jumps out a little bit to me because Mark Ingram had a big touchdown dependency year in that offense and you know, you miss a few screen passes and the numbers change. These next two are hilarious. Josh Jacobs and Kenyon Drake. <laughs> both had thirty three percent. Jacobs, you forget he had I think twelve touchdowns last year. What? Uh on the ground. Really? Yeah. He's got oh, like man. this cloud over him that makes he it does. Hard, hard to like comprehend that he was like a top ten running back in fantasy and scored a lot and Yeah, he um, had twelve rushing touchdowns. Twelve rushing touchdowns. So the uh, one that sticks out to me from this list, we talked about him earlier, but is DeAndre Swift. I mean, if 36% of his touch, uh, of his fantasy yes. value came from touchdowns, and then you go, I don't know how much, how many touchdown opportunities he the Detroit eight. Lions are going to have. Yeah. Swift had eight rushing touchdowns. Yeah, that's, that's concerning. On 114 concerning. carries. A little bit of worry there. So it's important to recognize those guys, and maybe, uh, Brooksy, maybe we can tweet out those lists just so that people can reference them down the line. But it would be uh, – it's just one of those things you want to keep in mind. You don't want to pay – Let's put it this way. Trading value, you don't want to pay 18 touchdown value for Devontae Adams, even though he's Devontae Adams. You don't want to pay, you know, uh, whatever it was, DeAndre Swift's eight touchdown value if you don't think the opportunity is going to be there. So just be be careful because they fluctuate. Yeah, and I actually have a little bit of that built into my next overreaction. Oh, I don't even know what it is. I want to talk about last year's darling who turned into a bit of a disappointment. Clyde Edwards Alaire, running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. And I just want to lay out uh you know what he did. There's and some players being drafted ahead of him that I, I think it's a little a little egregious. But just a reminder, last year, Clyde had eleven hundred yards from scrimmage in thirteen and a half games since nineteen ninety. Rookie running backs who hit that threshold in fewer than fourteen games. Marshawn Lev Bell, Todd Gurley, Leonard Fournette, Josh Jacobs, and now Clyde Edwards-Alaire. The season wasn't as catastrophic as people are making it out to be. Uh, so Clyde hit the 1,100-yard mark, 13 and a half games. Miles Sanders, 1,064 yards from scrimmage in 12 games. My champion, Antonio Gibson, had fewer yards from scrimmage than Clyde Edwards-Alaire. He had 1,014 or 1,042 yards in 14 games. Here's the problem. Consensus ranks out there have Miles and Gibson being drafted as running back one, as a running back one. Meanwhile, Clyde is being drafted as a middle tier running back two. Okay, uh, uh, running backs that you think of as these are elite pass catching running backs. Aaron Jones, 63 targets. Dalvin Cook, 54 targets. Clyde had. <laughs> Clyde Edwards had 55 targets last year. And here's where things went so south. So why'd he suck? Here is where things went south. Guys right around him in uh, in total touches, okay? Todd Gurley scored a touchdown on uh, – he averaged 24 touches per touchdown. Ronald Jones, 27 touches per touchdown. Kareem Hunt, 21. Clyde averaged a touchdown every 43.4 touches. The average of – Top 15 running backs, their touch to touchdown ratio was 25. And Clyde was at 43. He was 16th in total touches, by the way, for uh, at the running back position. He had he was snake bit with touchdown luck. He still produced. He before the injury, he was still, I believe, the running back 16 or so. And I just I think people are overreacting. The, the pendulum is swinging too far. I'm not saying that Clyde Edwards Alaire is going to be a top five running back. I'm not saying it's it looking back now, if you took him at one in your rookie draft and Jonathan, you passed on Taylor. Yeah, that sucks. That would that now it I think was the wrong decision. But I don't think that we need to bury Clyde as being a middle tier running back too, while we're just full on locking in Miles Sanders as a running back one. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I'm I'm sitting here and I'm pondering why there's some hesitation around Clyde because the numbers that you're saying, like that, especially that positive regression number, the 43, you know, the touchdown every 43.4 touches, that's asinine. 
And I think what it is, it, part of it's the draft capital and the hype, and the but yeah. part of it was, do you believe, and maybe Jason, you can answer this in a completely neutral fashion. Do you believe the team wants to hand the keys to the backfield to Clyde Edwards-Alaire? Like, Miles, he's the guy. Antonio Gibson, he's the guy. Something about Clyde's season, I think, made us feel like he, I, I don't remember him taking over. And I don't remember feeling like this team, like Kareem Hunt took over. I don't, something was missing there for me saying, well, I don't know what the future of Clyde is. Does he, does he, does his role increase? Do we have any guarantee of that? Like, that's my reaction. Now, I don't know if it's a, a overreaction, but Jason, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I was, I was down on Clyde before the NFL draft last year. Um, I, I, so I, I was not thinking he was the best prospect ever. Um, obviously he went in the first round and, and was disappointing for fantasy for where he was drafted. But when I watched the games last year and the, there was some infuriating utilization choices, I did feel like some of this is the fact that he is a rookie, um, you know, ahead of Pat Mahomes. I do think that he will be more involved this coming season, um, than he was last year. So you know, he had, a, what, 181 carries. I expect that number to go uh, well above 200 this coming season. Obviously, he'll have more games to do that. Um, but with the touchdown regression paired with, um, I believe, a, more utilization in the offense, yeah, I, I think he will I think he will go north. I think he's being under underdrafted right now. It's pretty difficult to find a situation you'd prefer more than Clyde on that offense. So and I, I I added it wrong. He eleven hundred yards in twelve and a half games. He missed three games. So he he missed three and a half games, and he was sixteenth in total touches at the running back position. So there's there's opportunity. There there is still a large amount of opportunity for for Clyde to bounce back and finish as a as a low end running back one. He's still on the highest powered offense, and there will be there will absolutely be maddening times like Andy Reid with his running backs. Even when it was Jamal Charles, I, there, I remember several times after a game of a press conference, "Hey Andy, why didn't Jamal Charles touch the ball more?" Uh, I wanted to. I, I, I you're my, right. I should. My bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get him more involved. Like <laughs> it was your choice. <laughs> so, it's going to happen. So let me let me ask you this because it'll kind of connect the dots on a couple of these points on overreaction episode. Miles Sanders, Philadelphia. I, I told you I don't think that they're an upper echelon team. I think they're a bottom third team. Let's just. Be generous there. I'm sorry, Philly fans. I've backed you up for two years. I've backed you yeah. up Carson Wentz. <laughs> I've predicted you to win a Super Bowl. I'm not – this isn't payback. It's just reality. This could be good for you, Philly fans. This I mean, could, yeah. he, <laughs> he guaranteed that you guys won a Super Bowl. You'd come back from the future. That's true. Um, it was the wrong alternate 19. <laughs> they're all happy right now. Um, yeah, they're, they're thrilled. <laughs> Philly fans, thrilled. That's yes. how I associate them. Um, but Miles Sanders – uh, in a situation with Jalen Hurts or Clyde, who you said, you know, you said Miles is going ahead on your board. Are you drafting Clyde ahead of Miles? Sanders? I am. I had announced you, you had uh, taken off for the day, but I had, when I was researching for Not this, surprising. Yeah, a big slacker. Uh, I had announced to the office, I'm like, I'm done. I'm done with Miles Sanders. Oh, he, my. He absolutely can still be excellent for fantasy football, but I, I had it. And aside from two two giant plays, which both, both of, were against both, me, both of those plays. and both ruined my freaking season, <laughs> I'd be the champ without those plays. But go you, on, you would be the champion had uh, Miles Sanders not ripped off the the huge. Was it the Saints? It was against the Pittsburgh or and was, the Saints. Yeah, so if, the two best run. De All right, sorry, but I was like, dude, if this is what if this is how people are valuing Miles Sanders, I'm out. You can have him. I'm. I'll take the L if I'm you wrong. You had a hard time but last I'm out. year with Miles Sanders. Yeah, from starting the year injured. To you know, having to count on a breakaway play other than it was a it couple was, of them. it was not fun to have him on your roster last year. If people are still in, well, Jalen Hurts fixes all. Yeah, well, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Apparently, we're water betting on Jalen Hurts already. I'm not surprised <laughs> yeah. about that. I'm not, I would be surprised if that wasn't the second or oh. third one we've done. I don't even know how many. I we've can't done. wait for for you both to forget that that happened. And before the season, it's going to be Jalen Hurts top five. <laughs>
quarterback Ooh. from, from oh, a, different, Jason. a different back. Yeah, he, Jason's just going to keep moving. He's going to move it up. And betting then, he fini- a, then, betting then he finishes it. Then he finishes at seven. We each water each other. <laughs> if you've not, if you're new to the show, I mean, it's not the worst time to to bring this up. It's it's March 31st. If you're brand new to the show, or it's April 1st. He was oh. just he was getting them. Yeah, oh. April first. Oh, April Fools. Uh, we haven't we don't talk about it a lot, but if you hear us make a water bet on the show, that ties in. That goes way back. So the origin story there is we have an app that we made, and that even goes further back to when we used to play ping pong and foosball, and we would just if you shut somebody out, you got watered, and we you spin the wheel, and there's a different way that you get a cup of water poured on you in a humiliating fashion. Mm-hmm. And so there is a free app out there. I think it's still out there. Wheelofwater.com. Uh, there's a f- website as well, and you can go grab that app and make bets with your friends. That's what we do, and that's what Jason uh, brought up with Mr. Jalen Hurts. So, All right, that'll do it for today's episode of the show. Would love to hear your feedback on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Back with another episode very soon, as well as a bonus episode at jointhefoot.com. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.